Good evening, everyone. Um, many of you know I was here on time. In fact, a number of people caught me outside the media, number one. But it is good to be here. And thank you all so very much for coming out tonight to our town hall meeting. Thank you to the city and um, state elected officials who are here. I thought I saw Representative Hill Evans coming in the doors. Always good to see you, ma'am. And I believe I saw some city council members. Okay, thank you all for being here. <clears throat> Excuse me. We are excited about being here in our Avenues Neighborhood Association we, uh, neighborhood. We want to thank the Avenues Neighborhood Association for sort of playing host as well uh, to us this evening. Thank you, Mary Ann Baggis, our president. There you are, our president, um, and all the residents of this area. We do appreciate you all, and thank you for coming out. We are here, if you didn't know, at Edgar Falls Smith School, a facility you will hear much more about a little later. Those of you who have joined us in the past know we tend to move these meetings around in our neighborhoods, in our neighborhoods near you, if you will. So we again appreciate being here. Um, I enjoy hosting uh, town hall meetings and have an opportunity to listen and hear from our residents the things that are going on and concerns in their area that are important to them. Um, Again, we've held these meetings throughout the city in an effort to reach all of our, our, our residents at varied times of the day and, and trying again to accommodate everyone. Since taking office as your mayor, we've held a meetings in many locations. Uh, we've been at William Penn Senior High School, Allen Park, the United Way, our own Lincoln Fire Station, City Council Chamber, um, and a, some uh, just a, a few places to name. So again, I'm very grateful to our past hosts, our future hosts, and again, just for having the opportunity to locate our meetings at um, venues throughout our beautiful city. So we try uh, to have these meetings quarterly. Uh, so look forward to the next one coming again near you. I want to thank the school district of the city of York for hosting us this evening. Thank you to our esteemed superintendent, Dr. Eric Holmes, for joining us this evening as well. Our director of community relations at Queen of Washington and Cliff Kern of WRCT, the manager told me that we will be live uh, this evening through Facebook Live. Uh, so we are encouraging our neighbors who are watching us throughout that medium to let us know if you have any questions or anything that you want to talk about so we can respond as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. Throughout this meeting, we will share with you what your city government is doing and remind you of the services that are indeed offered to all of our residents. We will also listen to your ideas and try to address any concerns that you might have as well. In the back, there's some information and uh, displays. Please take a look at it, look at those as well. We have some water, it looks like, back there. Uh, thank you, Deb Bush, for helping to organize everything this evening. We appreciate that. As always, there are events, activities, programs, and initiatives occurring in our city in the coming weeks and the coming months, if you will, that you will hear about um, throughout this evening. But first, again, we would like to again thank Dr. Holmes for joining us tonight and allowing us this space uh, for our town hall meeting. We asked Dr. Holmes to join us specifically to speak about the future STEAM Academy uh, to be housed at the school in the coming school year and to share with us um, anything else he might want to share as well. So we'll ask you to come on up now, sir, and take it. We'll, he'll be available to answer questions as he gives his presentation as well. Thank you, Dr. Holmes. Good evening, everyone. And welcome to the Edgar Falls Smith Steam Academy. Those are wonderful words for me because it has been several years since we've been able to have this building open, and I was very happy when we were asked by the Avenues Association to come and talk about the STEAM program and also to combine that conversation with the Mayor's Town Hall meeting. Uh, thank you for wanting to have it here, uh, and thank you for uh, the opportunity to talk a little bit about what we're going to be doing over the next few years uh, with our STEAM Academy. Uh, first of all, uh, there's a lot of work that goes into making this a reality. And I'd like to thank 
our new principal of the STEAM Academy, and that's Cassandra Ashley. Would you stand, please? Uh, Ms. Ashley uh, has been an assistant principal for several years here in the school district, and when I uh, considered opening this academy, she was the only person that I could think of uh, with the, the drive and dedication uh, necessary to make this a reality and to carry this across the goal line and she's been working diligently for the last uh, few weeks to make it happen, uh, as well as the custodial staff here. Uh, trust me, this building didn't look like this about a month or two ago. Uh, we've been working very hard to get it ready for our children uh, in the next uh, three and a half weeks. So let's talk a little bit about STEAM. How did we get here? We currently have a STEAM program, and we've had one for some time. It's located at the uh, Ferguson building, uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful concept. STEAM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, Arts, and Math. And that's going to be the focus of this school. Uh, people, people wonder, well, why isn't that the focus all, all over the place? Well, it is and it isn't, because focusing on these particular subject areas will be uh, how things work, but how it's taught is going to be the key, and we're going to get back to that later on. How it's taught. Remember how we're teaching science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. So there's Edgar Falls Smith. Up on the wall over here is a picture of Edgar Falls Smith. Does anybody know who he was? You know who he was? Uh, he was a scientist and uh, uh, just an influential person in the community. Yes, how interesting. He was a scientist. At the University of Pennsylvania, he was the head of the chemistry department. Uh, and that's who the school is named after. And how appropriate that a scientist uh, is the, uh, is the uh, namesake of this school when we're going to be dealing with science and technology and math. Uh, but we decided that since this building was uh, uh, open and available, and we had a program that we were very excited about and one that was working well, we wanted to expand it and give more of our children in the city the opportunity uh, to have this sort of educational experience. So why did we come here? Well, this is one of the reasons why. Look around the auditorium, look at the space. The program at Ferguson was crowded and we didn't have the resources that we wanted or that we needed to make the program as good as it could be. So we wanted the things that Smith offered, which was an auditorium, a gym, music room, more space and more opportunity to grow because our goal is not just to have this as an elementary program, but to eventually expand it into the high school so that we have a three through eight, a three through 12 program here in the school district. We also wanted to provide this for students district-wide. A lot of questions are asked about what's gonna happen and how the kids gonna get here, how does that work? Well, we're gonna be busing 75% uh, of the students here. Uh, we're gonna pick them up at their buildings and bring them here, and we're going to pick them up here and take them back to their buildings. The only two schools that will actually walk here will be Devers and Ferguson. Uh, so the majority of the kids coming in will be bused, and we expect to have 300 kids the first year, and we will be expanding by 100 kids a year after that. Eventually, our goal is to have about 650 kids here, which is about where we were before we closed uh, four years ago now. So one of the things that we decided to do when we were looking at expanding the STEAM program is to visit other places. We just didn't say, you know what, we're going to take what we currently have and just make it bigger. We wanted to make it better. So a group of teachers and administrators and school board members visited a school in Philadelphia, the Science Learning Academy. I suggest that if you have a chance to see it, that you go down because it's a wonderful place of learning. We also drove out to Pittsburgh, the wrong side of the state as I call it, because I consider Philadelphia the right side of the state. That's only because I'm from Philadelphia. But we drove out to Pittsburgh and spent the day out there and visited uh, three schools. And Pittsburgh has a STEAM program. And it's not just one school. They have several. And we wanted to see how it was done there. And we brought all those ideas back and the committee of people who've been working on this now for months came up with a proposal that we gave to our school board. And they graciously accepted it and told us to move forward. And that's how we're here. 
Uh, so a lot of the ideas and concepts that we're gonna be talking about are things that we learned as we went outside the city to see how it was done and how it was done right. So as we expand from grades four to eight and 150 kids to grades three through eight and 300 and then some, uh, we're gonna be doing things a little bit differently. And that's what I'm excited to talk about. Remember we mentioned before that it's how STEAM is taught instead of just what is taught? Well, this is the how. We're gonna use a project-based learning model. We're gonna do hands-on learning for our children. That's the way they learn the best. And we believe that with cooperative learning, with kids working together, with kids doing projects, that they will get it and it will be far more meaningful than a regular education setting. We want to use this as a model for the rest of our school district. We want to take the concepts that are going to be taught here and the instructional strategies that are going to be used here in this building and expand it to all of our schools. But we have to start someplace. And this is going to be our model. This is going to be our pilot program. This is going to be our experiment. And we're really excited about what we're going to be able to do. As you can see here, we have an engineering design process. Now, a lot of words are up there, but here's the main points. We want kids to be creative. We want kids to be able to come up with a problem and then come up with a solution, because that's the real world. Sitting in a classroom in rows of 10, listening to somebody talk is not how to educate children in 2017. Kids need to talk to each other, work together, collaborate, problem solve, and be critical thinkers. So that's how we're going to teach the science, the technology, the engineering, the arts, and the math. Through cooperative learning, through collaboration, and through a process. And we got this process from Pittsburgh and we just loved it so much that we wanted to bring it back here to York because as we walked around and talked to the children and the teachers, every one of them could tell you where they were in this process. Identifying the problem, brainstorming, designing, building, testing, sharing, redesigning, and then going back to the drawing board again. That teaches critical thinking skills. And that's the key. When we talked to the teachers who wanted to teach here, we interviewed them. And we only wanted those people who were committed to teaching this way. And that's who we're gonna have here in this building. So we're really excited about the engineering design process. That's the foundation. That's what makes this place different than every other place. And we hope eventually that we can spread this to all of our schools. So what's the difference between projects and project base? Notice the students are there individually on a computer doing something. You can do it alone. Project base, you have to do it with other students. It requires collaboration. So just giving a kid a project to do and say, go do that, that's great. And you can use computer and technology and that's wonderful. But it doesn't really spark that interest unless they're working with other people. Because that's the job market of today. People working with each other. So these are just some shots of what we're currently doing at, at our uh, Ferguson School. And this is an eighth grade class. On the corner here on the left, you notice those bananas there? The kids hooked, I guess, wires, some sort of technology. And I'm probably gonna have to come to STEAM every day to learn how this works. But they hooked up those bananas to a program and uh, one of the students played piano with the bananas and made a song, okay? And these are eighth grade students. Um, you have kids there who made their own drums, again, through the whole process and hooked them up through the computer. And then we also, you know those uh, dance revolution machines you see in the malls where the kids are jumping around and killing their knees so when they're my age they can't walk anymore? Well, they also made those. Our kids made these things with their own hands and their own imagination. And this is what we want more of our kids to be able to do. So again, how does it benefit our students? We can have more kids here. 
more kids can take advantage of it. Uh, we will be teaching collaboration and inquiry. And kids will be able to pick their own problems and then pick their own solutions. We're going to make education interesting for them. We're going to make it fun. We're going to make them have a part, a, 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 a huge part of their own educational experience. And that's how you encourage the love of learning. So one of the things I shared with the board and I've been sharing with teachers and, and audiences around the city is this quote, because I read a book by Grant Lickman about two years ago. And he went and visited all the premier schools in the United States of America. All those schools that were on the cutting edge of doing those things that we were talking about. And one of them was the school in Philadelphia that we visited, the Science Learning Academy. And what he said is that if we don't change what we're doing in education, not in urban education, but in education everywhere around the country, then we're not going to have a public school system anymore. And the system will look completely different in 20 years, 25 years, than it does right now. And the reason why is because we are not meeting the needs of students and parents are going to be pulling their kids out because we need to have individualized education and we need to have collaboration and we need to teach kids how to think. And so that sparked me to do something here in the school district of the city of York. And we already had a program ready to roll and we had an empty school, that's a beautiful building, and here's our opportunity to make a difference. And the world doesn't care what you know. Those are all the facts that you can get on Google now. They care about what you can do with what you know, because that's what makes it work. So we're excited uh, to have you here in our auditorium. This is the second event we've had here since we reopened the building. Uh, we had a play a little while ago about a month ago, and it was wonderful to see you all here. Uh, it's wonderful for you to come, and we invite you back on August 9th at 5 o'clock. That's when we're going to have our open house, and I invite the mayor and as well as all the cabinet to come, uh, and we're going to do a little presentation here. They're going to take you on a tour of the building. All of our teachers will be here. They'll be able to talk to you, and we may have some students here as well. But we are excited about the, the possibilities this holds for the school district of the city of York. We have had the complete support of our board of school directors uh, and their commitment to making the change as well. Uh, and we're just excited and we look forward to seeing you soon. And for those folks who live in the, uh, in the avenues, uh, we are happy to be back and we're gonna be good neighbors. Uh, and uh, as I told her about a half an hour ago, if you have any problems, see Angela. <laughs> but I doubt that you will. Uh, she will be very happy to deal with any issues that arise, uh, but uh, we're excited about this and uh, we, we believe that this will be a whole different situation than what it was a few years ago when this was a middle school. Um, so I, again, I, I thank the mayor for having me uh, and I'll be happy to take any questions that you may have. Uh, we have been very prudent with your money. Uh, the building was closed uh, due to financial uh, issues several years ago. Uh, we combined all of our uh, elementary schools into K-8 buildings. Both Hennepin and Smith were closed. We reopened Hennepin three years ago now, uh, and uh, we're reopening Smith this year. Uh, the money uh, is from uh, the general fund we have been able to increase our fund balance and we have a comfortable fund balance now and we're able to take some of that money and reinvest it back into this building. N no, that's not correct. It's from our fund balance because we have been saving money. We have a, a brilliant business manager who's been able to uh, bring this district back from the brink. Uh, actually recently we were just notified that our uh, bond rating just went back up again, so it is where it was prior to the financial crisis that we had a few years ago. Uh, so we're making great strides. Thank you. Thank you. 
and we've been able to generate and save um, a, a nice nest egg to do programs like this without raising your taxes. And the Board of School Directors didn't, has not raised taxes in this city for four years. Yes, sir. The first uh, round of selection was, uh, there's no criteria other than the fact that you have to want to be here. And we did it sort of first come, first serve, and we took those students who were already in the program, and we added about 150 other students from the other schools. But the, the key to, to this whole program is that you have to want to be here, and you have to keep your grades up. You have to keep a 75 average, you have to behave yourself, and you have to be a good citizen. Those are the only criteria. There's no academic criteria or grade criteria. We want all kids to benefit from it, but they have to make a commitment and their parents have to make a commitment. Mm -hmm. Yes. I don't really have a question. Uh, Miriam Beck is here. I just want to say on behalf of the neighborhood, we are delighted to have you back in the neighborhood. And um, I know there were issues in the past and we, we, we uh, want the school to know they are our neighbors and we are theirs and we want to be good neighbors and I'm so happy to hear you say the school wants to be a good neighbor too. So we will work hard to make sure it works for both the, the residents and the school. Thank you. I was principal here from 2002 to 2007 and worked with Marianne and the, and the Avenues Association and uh, I know that they were always good neighbors. They uh, volunteered their time. They came to the building. They, they did things for the kids. Uh, and it's important for us to be good neighbors uh, because this is a lovely neighborhood. Uh, and the, the fact that it hasn't had the sound of children uh, walking through the streets for the last few years, I think, is a, is a sad thing. And we're happy to be back. And we appreciate uh, your outreach. And we look forward to working with you. And, I'm sure Mrs. Ashley and you will get to know each other really well. Yes? Will this program be bilingual? All of our programs are bilingual. Yes? I'd like to make a comment that is very encouraging. I spent my career teaching Indian bio and environmental science at Center. and did a lot of volunteering after I retired at Rogers Academy. What you heard tonight is for real. That is exactly what has needed to be done. Well, I came up in an era when teaching was the more remote kind of stuff, you know, you were learning and so forth. But the, I'll give you a prime example of today's situation. Gene and I had a bed and breakfast, as you know, we get guests from around the world and across the states. We interact with them all the time. And uh, a particular theme comes out from the business people, the corporate people, and we've also had corporations that have met with little units in our home for several hours, and they bring over brilliant young Chinese mathematicians and engineers, and they, they sit down and they work X number of hours, and then and he and I get a chance to talk to the head honcho, and he said, uh, you know, pick his brain a little bit about the very things that you brought up here. I said, tell, tell me how that works. He said, well, here's something. These young guys are so brilliant, but they have been taught to use that brilliance in a certain framework. And if, if a, something is presented to them that's just outside that framework, they have no idea what to do about it or how to think about it. That's modern day, that's modern day right now. So the more we can get the students to take their own personal pride and be willing to put some work ethic into it and get their parents behind it, neighborhood behind it. That, that's the key this whole country needs. <laughs> Thank you. Yes? Are there other, um, as you say that it's for or treat or whatever, are other school districts or schools promoting the younger, like, the pre-Ks to try to come here. I mean, I believe in what you say, 
Um, you know, I, I've only lived here two years, and you know, as a grandmother, um, I see uh, budding knowledge that these young kids want to know. So, are there any other pre Ks or any other school districts trying to promote prior to what you're doing here to say this is what you're promoting and just get here and back you in what you're doing from third or fourth grade on? What we're looking at, at least in this building, uh, is to uh, get the kids at a particular age. Uh, I know you've probably heard this before, but from kindergarten to grade three, you're learning to read. From grade three on, you're reading to learn. And we wanted to make sure that when the kids got to this program, that they had a solid reading foundation so they could take the next step. Uh, that's what we wanted to concentrate on. Uh, we didn't want to be a traditional elementary school. Uh, we wanted to be a STEAM academy. And so we're going to start the kids off in third grade uh, with STEAM related activities and teach them at that age how to collaborate. So by the time they get to the high school, they'll be pros at it. But I'm not aware of any other school district in the area um, that uh, is doing this right now, uh, but I'm sure that th they have some. I know that Hanover has a program at the high school level. Uh, that's, that's an elective program. I know other schools offer STEAM related courses, but there is no st other STEAM school in the county of York. We would love to have you. See Angela. <laughs> Thank you. Well, again, thank you so much. And we hope to see you all back here on August 9th at 5 o'clock. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much, Dr. Holmes. I, I appreciate that update as well. It's always a pleasure working with you, sir. There are a couple of things I want to share with you, and then I'll ask the directors to share with you updates uh, from their various areas as well. Um, a few things that are on the horizon for my office um, include uh, some of you probably know we have a new app in the city of York, and we're encouraging people to use it. Um, you can, it's as easy as visiting our website, www.yorkcity.org, um, which has been re-engineered, if you will, and is hopefully providing an improved uh, experience. Um, but you can still share your ideas, concerns, uh, contact York, if you will. Uh, tab that located still that tab is still located on the website. Um, you can also complete a customer service satisfaction survey as well too. So, but if you visit our website, you can easily download the app, our city app, um, from your website. And I'm going to ask Aguina put her on a spot for a second, real quick, just to give a little bit of an update on that. And then, Chief, I'm coming your way to give an update, Chief Kelly, an update on the police app. So, Aguina. Thank you, Mayor Bracey. Good evening, everyone. As Mayor Bracey mentioned, if you do go to our website at www.yorkcity.org, when you click on the screen, there's a red tab at the top. If you click on that, it takes you to a page where you can either download the app for your Android or you can download the app for your Apple. And once you do that, it's automatically on your phone or your tablet. And then you can utilize the app uh, to communicate with City of York staff or you can use the app if you have any quality of quality of life issues or concerns, you can take a picture of the issue and it will immediately go to a staff member and they will respond back to you. You can also pay for parking tickets, you can pay your sewer um, on that app and there's a whole host of other things you can keep up to date with events and programming that we have occurring here in the city of York. So it's a good way to stay in contact uh, with uh, several of our staff members as well as if you see anything that's occurring for you to take a picture and if you don't have, you don't have to take a picture but you can um, leave a message and send it to a staff person and they will respond to you. Thank you. Yeah. Good evening. 
the uh, York City Police Department around the same time that the city came out with their app, we developed an app for both the iPhone and the Android. Uh, basically, it's to enhance our anonymous tip line. So if you go on and you search for the York City Police Department's app, once you have the app, the great thing that it does is you no longer have to call in to uh, my assistant to have your name put on to receive uh, alerts and those sorts of things that, that go out. You automatically receive every alert, every press release, that the York City Police Department does, you'll be able to uh, send us an anonymous tip the same way you used to, but this time you won't have to, to go through all the, uh, the measures you had to before to send a tip. And there's also a crime map on there. And one of the great things about the crime map, it's actually the same map that we use on a regular basis within the police department. But you can look at your area, you can look what the crime is real time in your area. As our officers do reports, it goes into our records management system, it'll show up on your app. If you hit on it, it'll tell you, it won't tell you the exact address, it'll tell you the block that the event occurred in. And it'll also allow you, if, if you have any information, you can text us anonymously and send us information that way also. You may have been on your way to work, you may have been on your way to the store or something, and uh, you didn't realize an incident happened, but when you go back and look at it, you say, oh wow, I didn't know that a uh, burglary happened in that area. Well, I saw this car that I normally don't see in that area. That stuff's important to us. So this is just another way to make it a little easier for you all to communicate with us and for us to communicate with you. Because as soon as you get the app, you automatically get every alert that, uh, that we send out. So make sure you go and look it up if anybody has any problems uh, finding it, which you shouldn't, but uh, you know, get a hold of us and, and we'll help you out. All right, thank you. Thank you. Again, ways that we are making it easier to stay connected to your city government. So uh, please check out our website again, check out these apps, and stay connected to us. I encourage everyone, as some of you know, um, to do all that you can and stay physically fit. Um, move with low impact exercise, such as walking. Uh, monthly, usually around the lunchtime hour um, on a Wednesday, I've been leading a brisk walk in our historic Penn Commons Park, and we've encouraged our neighbors and others, uh, co-workers, to join us too. Our next walk will be Wednesday, August 15th at the park. Um, please join us. It's always a fun time and a good time to chat with your neighbors as well too and, and try to keep up with me as we walk briskly around the park. Um, so with that, I'm going to yield to our business administrator, uh, Michael Dowry, to give an update from that area. Um, we're going to go through the presentations, but if you have questions, please try to remember them or jot them down. We're asking folks to use the community mic here that Dr. Holmes used so that everyone can hear the question. Um, again, we're streaming live, so we want others to hear it as well. We will uh, then go to our deputy director, Mr. Chaz Green, who is an introduction to some of you, our deputy director of public works, if you will. As many of you know, Jim Gross is retiring, and Chaz has been uh, filling in very well. And then we're going to go to this side of the table to our, why are you smiling, Shabaski? <laughs> Shabaski Buffalo, our Deputy Director of Community Economic Development. We'll then go to our fire chief, a resident of this area, uh, Dave Michaels, and then uh, the Chief Wes Kelly of our police department. And again, we'll be available. We want to hear from you, any concerns, and answer your questions too, but I want them to give their reports to you first, and then we'll answer your questions. So, Michael, please. Good evening. Uh, the format of these town hall meetings change uh, pretty much every quarter, and this is one of those spotlight kind of meetings. I much rather prefer the Q&A style, but so here we are. Um, it feels good to be back in Smith Middle School. Uh, last time I was here was probably four or five years ago. My son was doing a band concert. Um, a little painful to the ears, so the, uh, <laughs> the information tonight is much more, uh, much more pleasing. Uh, but on behalf of Mayor Bracey, I want to thank you for uh, having me here tonight and uh, jump in. And my role with the city as business administrator, uh, I'm responsible for several different um, aspects of city government. Uh, the most important thing I think that I work on is the budget. Uh, so from year to year, uh, setting the general fund budget and the other funds, our general fund budget is approximately $40 million. 
but in all, we're looking at about a hundred million dollar budget each year. So a lot of that is already allocated, legacy costs, et cetera. But we try to do what we can uh, from year to year to make things better here in the city. Uh, so from the budget, uh, working on the audit, the annual reconciliation, making sure that we did spend the money the way that we were supposed to. Uh, and then also human resources. So we have some uh, handouts in the back uh, with the current job openings. And whatever is not there now, uh, our website, www.yorkcity.org, keeps a current listing, and you can apply right there online. Uh, beyond that, you can also apply in person there at City Hall. Uh, also, information technology. So our IT department, our network throughout the city, as we try to uh, encourage and advance technology and work more efficient, do more with less, uh, we become more and more reliant upon technology. So critical piece. Uh, but between those uh, two areas and finance uh, is where I spend, spend my time. Uh, over the past two years, we've been working on a five-year fiscal plan. Um, when, we, when I assumed the position in 2015, uh, Things were pretty bleak. Uh, people were talking bankruptcy and uh, Act 47 and such, and we don't like those words. You know, uh, we don't like it in our own households, and nor do we like it for our city government. So, uh, the mayor responded quickly. Uh, we put together a five-year plan to reduce real estate taxes and to make some other advances here in city government. So we're into a year two of that, and things are progressing well. Uh, we're on track to reduce real estate taxes by 15% by the year 2020. Uh, and we're working on a longer term plan to uh, even sustain a reduction of, of even greater, a greater reduction. So we're currently meeting uh, with five organizations to help uh, develop a 20 year plan. Uh, so I've been meeting with Salem Square, uh, Chris Fasadics, the Black Ministers Association, um, Better York, and Jeff Kirkland to, uh, to help formulate that plan. Uh, keeping the group small right now just to start to put the rough framework together, but definitely circling around to as many nonprofits, many organizations as possible to gain it, garner input. Uh, but there's, it's gonna be impossible to meet with every organization one-on-one -on, -one on a regular basis. So I have to encourage all of you to participate in the 2018 budget process as much as possible. Uh, the squeaky wheel gets grease. Uh, and unfortunately, there isn't a great turnout at our budget hearings. We attempted a new format this past year, of moving our hearings to the evening, uh, hopefully, uh, and combining them with city council so we only have one set of hearings. But hopefully in doing so, it's uh, able to foster more community involvement. And uh, we, we, we need to hear from you, we want to hear from you, not on the back end, but on the front end to help with the planning. But, and also on the back end, too, please don't get me wrong, um, to continue to hold us accountable. So I'm just going to briefly touch on a couple metrics to show you or talk more about the framework or what we're dealing with from a financial perspective. Uh, as much as we want to divert uh, spending to programming and, and to introduce new things in the city, uh, continue to invest in our infrastructure, et cetera, there are certain financial things that we just have to take care of. So there are five key metrics that I've been uh, keeping a hold on or, or, or focusing on as we work through our plan. The first is our pension plan funding ratio. As we all know, pension plans is a, a funding crisis throughout the, the country. It's not just a York City thing. Uh, well, we are uh, distressed. Right now, our pension plans are about 65% funded. It means we have about a 35% unfunded, unfunded, which is about $60 million. Um, 65% is not good. As we stand in an educational institution, 65% uh, or a D would not get it done. So we definitely want to get it up to a B or an A. We want to get up into the 80 or 90 range. But our goal right now is to at least get it up to 70%. If we can get it up to 70% by 2020, it's us continuing to move in the right direction. When, we, uh, when I came into the office in 2015, we are about at 58%. So we're going in the right direction. We're up from 58 to 65, but we still have a long way to go. Uh, next would be other post-employment benefits. Um, this is a, a significant liability, about $27 million, retiree health care and other post-employment benefits that are legacy costs that were promised years ago. Uh, right now, that's about $27 million, and we need $27 million, all but 26 or $25 million there, thereabout. So this is... Um, this will take time, uh, even at, by the end of the uh, five-year plan, by 2020, we will not be anywhere near where we need to be, but we need to continue to advance the, uh, the needle, move the needle in the right direction. Uh, property taxes. As a whole, city, school, and county combined, we're at 5.93%. 
you're basically paying for 6% 6 of your house every year. Uh, a house that's assessed at 50000 is that's $3,000 a year. $100,000 home, $6,000 a year. Uh, it's, it's way too much, way too much. Uh, benchmark comparing us to other third class cities in our region or other municipalities surrounding suburbs, we need to get that down to at least 3%. Uh, right now we're at six, so we need to cut that in half. Uh, there's a long way to go on that. A 15% reduction on just the city taxes gets us going in the right direction, but there's a lot more work that needs to be done. And even though we've lowered taxes uh, 3% in the, in the past year, the county has raised uh, double-digit uh, rate increases. So it's offset everything we've done and actually taken us in the wrong direction. That's not to point fingers. Uh, county is dealing with just as many uh, fiscal issues as we are and so is the school district, but it's just to say that all three have to work together in order to uh, move the community in the right direction. Credit rating, um, pleased to announce that the city also uh, just recently received an increase in its credit rating, and uh, we are now investment grade again at a triple B rating. Uh, with that, we're working on a debt refinance that should save four and a half million dollars and uh, eliminate the city's uh, general fund debt 14 years earlier. So we could be t debt free in the next 10 years. <laughs> that deal should close at the August City Council meeting. Um, well, should be approved at the August, August City Council meeting, but then close in September, October. Uh, and then operating reserves. Um, just as Dr. Holmes was alluding to earlier, the need to build up a significant reserve. I mean, we never know when the next budget impasse may happen at the federal or state level. Uh, what could happen in general, just like uh, our personal finances, it's always prudent to have two to three months of reserves uh, on hand. For us, that number is about $7 million. We're about halfway there. Uh, and if we continue to move in the right direction through this five-year plan, we'll meet our goal by 2020. So those are the most important uh, financial metrics that, that I uh, deal with. Out of those meetings with the organizations, what I just want to talk about quickly, very quickly, <laughs> is uh, what is the focus? So while we're looking at those financial metrics, it's uh, to also keep us focused on what we can do to better serve our taxpayers. Uh, regionalization, collaboration with the York County and others to consolidate the collection of real estate taxes. Uh, right now, the York County alone has 72 real, uh, tax collectors, 72 treasurers. That's way too many uh, <laughs> to do the same job over and over again. If we can consolidate our operation with the county, we could save the city $100,000 a year, uh, 50000 of that going to the school district. Uh, copier and print services, simple things. Human Relations Commissions continue to work with the surrounding municipalities. Uh, more emphasis on code enforcement, public safety, um, property maintenance inspectors. Um, also looking at infrastructure projects, uh, expansion, well, I'll let the public works director speak to that. I won't steal any of his thunder. Last thing I want to say is just to run down a quick list of quick hitters that we've been looking at. There we go. Support state level of property tax reform. Um, Complementary projects to developers that are doing things in our neighborhoods. What can we do as a city to, to enhance those projects? Uh, develop a timeline to do it all. Quantify public safety costs. Leverage state-sponsored public-private partnerships. Develop a sustainability plan. Neighborhood revitalization through General, generational opportunities to recapture the housing market, uh, neighborhood investment, uh, friendly and efficient government service, cleanliness, code enforcement, code enforcement, public safety, improve residential parking in neighborhoods, um, increase home ownership, uh, absorbing a high influx of an immigration immigrant population, um, schedule quarterly meetings, meet on a regular basis, and do this much more often. So. I don't know if it's Q&A at this point or we'll, we'll yeah. wait to the end, but uh, I'm always here to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Hello. All right. It's good to be here. Um, just want to take this time to talk about some upcoming events and some things we have going on in Public Works right now. and then. Uh, 
when we get done, you guys can ask some questions. Uh, uh, first, for our upcoming events, we have each Tuesday and Thursday throughout August, um, come and enjoy free musical entertainment or downtown Cherry Lane. Um, it's from 11.30 to 1.30. We have different genres of music, such as jazz, folk, indie, country, classic hits, Irish, Hawaiian, blues, cigar box, guitar, hip hop, and more. So we have something for everyone, I believe. Um, also on Saturday, August 26th and August 27th. On Saturday, it'll be from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. And on Sunday, it'll be from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. We'll host our annual York Fest. All right, the York Fest will be held um, well, actually, York Fest is a fine arts festival in and around the Colonial Courthouse Courtyard, along the rail trail, and inside the Agricultural Industrial Museum um, in the Creative York Gallery. So please come out and join us. It's nice, definitely a nice event um, that, that you guys will definitely enjoy. Uh, on Friday, September 29th, uh, from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m., we'll host our 23rd annual bike night downtown. All right, so please come out for that as well. Uh, parade, games, concessions, please come and support. All right, um, so I just got a question for, for you guys. Does anyone have any old TVs they need to get rid of and looking to get rid of it? Get rid of them? Anyone? Got a couple? Okay. All right, so um, just wanted to give you guys some information that I actually had, had came across, but the York County Solid Waste Authority uh, will be opening up a new facility by the end of the year, and they're going to be collecting like, electronics and television and et cetera uh, Monday through Fridays from 8 p.m. to 4 p.m., and also from Saturdays from 8 a.m. to noon. All right, so I think that's a good thing. I, I know a lot of us are always looking, and we get the calls as well, what we can do with the television. So we want to make sure you guys were aware of that. Um, also, collection tips with our trash and stuff like that. Just wanted to give you guys a, a couple things. Um, just make sure you're just not overloading your trash bags and keeping it uh, 32 gallons and 40 pounds. All right, it's the max. Um, you want to place items at pickup points by 6 a.m., the day of collection to ensure collection pickup. Uh, never place items out until after 5 p.m. the night before scheduled collection. Um, each property has only one collection point, so you just want to make sure that if you know your point, if it's the front, the back, or the side. We just want to make sure, because we don't want to miss the, we don't want to miss it. So sometimes we get calls in and, and someone says they put the trash out on the side and the collection point was in the front, you know. So we just want to make sure that we're being able to service everyone. Um, another thing is scheduling large items. Uh, so that's a big thing. Um, normal household items, you, you can schedule in advance of seven to 10 days. All right, but our phone number is 843-1240. All right, once again, that number is 843-1240. And that line is developed from nine to four, Monday through Thursday, okay? Um, then also just remind reminder about tying your bags in the trash can helps to prevent litter as well as enable a can to be empty without residue uh, being spilled all over. All right. Another thing is we have coming up is our it will be in your mailbox by October 1st or sooner. All right. And it's going to be our public works newsletter. OK. Um, public works newsletter. What it will include is our holiday collection schedules for Thanksgiving, Christmas and New Year's uh, and the street sweeping curbside yard waste collections. Uh, leaf vacuuming and Christmas tree collections, along with other public works related programs. All right. Also, um, publicly, I just wanted to thank our crews. Uh, you know, obviously, we've been battling these storms over the last uh, over last week, and, and we had some issues with trees coming down, lights out. Uh, I just wanted to thank our guys publicly from our, our, our um, electrical bureau, building maintenance, parks, recreation, sanitation, um, the highway bureau. Um, just want to thank thank all those guys for the hard work and dedication that they put in to service you guys. I mean, that's what we're here for, and we'll continue to service you guys if you guys allow us. So just want to thank those guys uh, for their help. Um, also, if you guys have any questions or concerns uh, pertaining, to any, pertaining to anything regarding public works, uh, my office number is 717-849-2251. Please feel free to call anytime. Uh, leave a message. Uh, or whatever, if I pick up, we can talk. Um, I'm here to serve you guys. So please, once again, that number is 717-849-2251. All right. Thank you for your time and appreciate you guys having us. Hello, everyone. Shavosky Buffalo, Interim Director of Economic and Community Development. I want to give you a quick rundown on programs and projects that we have in the queue, some things that we've been advancing over the last six months. 
um, specifically and most notably in your neck of the woods, um, there's been a significant undertaking of Elm Terrace apartment building, 450 Madison Avenue. Um, it's been a labor of love and a dogged pursuit over the last 10 years, or actually the last seven years since 2010. Um, the Redevelopment Authority was able to successfully acquire that property through eminent domain and reposition it with the disposition of a sale to one Mr. Seth Predix. Um, that project is currently completed phase one of its development. There are 25 mid-market apartments currently for lease at that facility. Um, Predix is listing those and renting them up through his own property management company. And we look to see phase two of that project actually complete by December 1st of this year. Um, so again, we've been making a dogged effort to try to pursue as much blight as we can within the avenues area specifically. And uh, not to tip our hand too much, but there is one that we have on Maryland Avenue that's currently in our sights. Um, secondarily, and this is more so for Mr. Landis, who's also a champion of the city, specifically in this neighborhood. Um, it's been long within our efforts and our desire to move, to move forward with the neighborhood improvement ordinance. Um, with our partnership with QDOT, the city has recently acquired four handheld devices, which now enables us to ticket our most egregious offenders that, that don't necessarily subscribe to the social contract. And that social contract being, if you have trash, put it in the receptacle. If you have large items, call Mr. Green's team. If you have anything that you want to basically dispose of in the public right of way that presents a nuisance or detracts from the quality of life of other residents in our community, you will be ticketed and pursued by our dogged property maintenance inspectors. So, <laughs> it's one of those things where, um, quite frankly, out of the things that I have to do all day, um, it's one of those guilty pleasures when I can actually see that our folks have gone out and actually ticketed someone that takes us from the other work that really dedicates most of our time. So we hope to see big results within the next six months of our folks rolling these out, getting these folks basically that are ne'er-do-wells and the outliers to the problem, hopefully within line. Um, if you're not aware of it, tickets start with a warning. The secondary ticket is a $25 fine. Thereafter, it starts to increase in multiples of 100% until we actually get the behavior that we want from our residents. So again, based off the app that Aquina shared with you, we take complaints both through conventional means of phone calls um, as well as the app. So if there is something that you can notify our team of, we will get our PMIs out to look at them in every district and hopefully get it resolved within good dispatch. Um, moving along, you may have noticed that our property maintenance inspectors have been out in the neighborhoods every Tuesday all summer. We're talking about some of the 95 degree days um, all day and basically putting in the legwork to go out and do two things. They're going out and basically looking at specific areas within our neighborhoods that need attention and bringing hopefully some some resolution to those items that we find that need to be addressed. Secondarily, they are also going out, and you may have noticed they're taking pictures of properties along major thoroughfares. So don't be alarmed, it's not Big Brother watching you. It's basically a tool that we need, hopefully in our, to our disposal, to really identify the extent of blight and or land use conditions in our community. Um, last year, Mayor Bracey and our team were able to go to a Community Progress Leadership Institute event and we've adopted some of the best practices that we learned at that activity from those folks. And one of the things that they've admonished us to do in terms of being able to address this issue of blight and repositioning our properties is to go forth and basically develop a comprehensive citywide parcel survey. What that means is of every, I think it's 14,787 parcels plus or minus 100 throughout our entire community. We wanna go through and identify specifically how are those properties used are they residential? Are they multifamily? Are they attached, detached, whatever it may be? Are they institutional? Are they business? Whatever it may be. But more importantly, what's the land condition of that property? Now, it's not intended to be nitpicky and say, well, we don't like Ms. Jackson's house at 123 Main Street because the color's yellow. The issue is, is Ms. Jackson's property at 123 Main Street substandard minor or substandard major in its condition? Is it dilapidated? Is it vacant? Is it a blight in the community? Um, one of the biggest questions that we take away with when we go to ask folks for money is, well, how big is the problem in York? So far, anecdotally, we've given a rough estimate that of the 14,000 parcels in our city, less than 1% of those are a blight. That number, we want to quantify and be able to dial that in specifically to report to you all where the issues are. But what we hope to do with this tool is use this to better inform our decisions about where to specifically spend our scant resources, the money that Mr. Dari's trying to save us specifically that we don't take it and squander it. So if we can develop strategies around this parcel survey, 
move into a direction where we can actually implement other tools and identify ways to take and leverage where we identify problems to be or where we see trends of success, the hope is to take this information and make an informed decision about how to allocate our resources. Uh, moving along, you may have heard recently that the Redevelopment Authority has also purchased Penn Market. That's not necessarily a means of just buying property for the sake of buying property, but it's buying property for the sake of preserving an asset and doing something constructive with it that's a community benefit. Um, you may notice in the back we have some charrettes available for you to take a look at, but Penn Market has been a fixture and a staple in this community for 150 years, and we'd like to see it continue in that fashion going forward for another 150 years. So Mayor Bracey has given us the marching orders to do something that benefits the community specifically as it relates to this particular asset. Our hope is that we can address the food desert issue, figure out ways to bring more effective health and quality of life to residents in the city in terms of getting them reacquainted with where their food comes from. It's not necessarily in a cellophane bag, but it actually does produce somewhere in dirt or it eats some grass someplace else. But the hope is that we can actually take this and use this opportunity over the next two to three years to identify ways to take Penn Market reposition it and return it back to the community and bring it back to a higher, more productive use that's sustainable. Not that it's not been managed properly before, but they have had some challenges with basically managing and operating that facility. So we saw this as an opportunity for government to interface in a true public-private partnership to move this project forward. <laughs> and two things before I wrap up, just for my housekeeping, I know you said succinct, I know. <laughs> Um, the last of which, and this is compliments to both our partners at Downtown Inc., but also the commitment for a natural amenity here in our community. Um, we've recently gotten approval through City Council for the extension of the Heritage Rail Trail through the Northwest Triangle. <laughs> Kudos to Mr. Chaz Green for leading the helm on that, on that particular effort to get everything you know, subdivided and prepared. But we hope within the next two years to actually see that extension continue from Lafayette Plaza through to George Street and the Stadium District and onwards to John Rudy Park within the near future. But that also gives me an opportunity to at least tell you from a labor of love standpoint that we still have two irons in the fire at the Triangle, specifically with the Time Group, who would like to develop residential housing, and a new dark horse that's shown up, the York Plan 2.0 with John McGilligott and his team. So we hope to see some advancements of those projects over the next few months to the community's benefit in terms of tax impacts and economic development. So with that being said, I will do one last shameless plug and move that way. Um, we do have a significant amount of seats still available on authorities, boards, and commissions. So if any of you are interested, and also I'm going to steal some of your volunteers, sir. If you're willing to volunteer and serve in any municipal capacity, and if your heart moves you to be civic-minded, we would love to have you there. Mr. Landis can give you his testimony. He served for I don't know how many years um, as one of the champions of making sure that the quality of life of the residents, his neighbors, weren't necessarily trampled on. And we'd love to give you the opportunity as well to serve in any capacity, whether it's planning commission, zoning hearing board, consolidated board of appeals, whatever it may be. But we encourage you to get involved. While most of the heavy lifting takes place with this team, a lot of it would not be done without your support and your efforts to help us back it up. So thank you for the time. Good evening. I'm Fire Chief David Michaels, and I'll give you an update on your fire department and uh, tell you a little bit of what's, what's been happening. First of all, to date, uh, the firefighters have been uh, busy with calls. Uh, we, we've answered over 1,850 calls for service already this year. Uh, just to, to give you, to compare that, last year we ran 3,106 3, calls, so one pace already to, uh, to surpass that. Um, one thing we just took on was a uh, training for our firefighters and officers. Uh, fortunately, through a grant, we were able to get uh, funds and train our, our firefighters up to a fire officer one and two level. Uh, again, this will ensure that you're going to have capable, competent fire officers uh, as we move forward um, with our department. Uh, in January, we, uh, we trained all of our firefighters and we begin to carry naloxone. Uh, to date, we've, we've been busy with that. Um, we've administered uh, naloxone or revived 56 patients with that. So again, it is a tool that we have now to go out and uh, uh, help save lives. Uh, another thing that we've just recently taken on, the, the County of York is upgrading their radio system. Uh, they're, they're switching from our, our current, uh, it, it's a 500 megahertz system, they're going to a 700 megahertz, some technical stuff there. 
Um, we are, again, cap we, we've upgraded all of our radios already. Currently, the two systems, the old and new, are running side by side. But um, again, just so you, you're aware and for, for your safety, uh, our firefighters are able to communicate with each other as well as, other, as, well as with other agencies uh, that we do work with. Our fire prevention personnel uh, continue to re or remain busy with inspections. Uh, they've been putting an emphasis on commercial properties uh, to make sure, again, the buildings in our community are safe, uh, doing the proper inspections there, and also issuing the uh, required operational permits. Uh, we go out and do those inspections and get those permits issued. Uh, working uh, on maintaining the vacant property registration and, again, the inspections that go with those. Uh, also remain busy with uh, public education. So uh, not just fire, but all of our firefighters are out uh, talking to kids, uh, programs, workplaces, and uh, getting that fire prevention message out there. Currently, we are working to uh, attain, obtain funding for a fire safety house, a, uh, a trailer type vehicle that we could take out. Uh, the kids could learn how to escape fires. Uh, you know, we can put some fake smoke in there, uh, work on meeting spots, those type things. Um, and that's all through grants and donations. Uh, we're about at our 50% level of that, so we're going to continue to work on that, and hopefully that's a tool that we'll be able to use in our fire prevention uh, message. Our emergency management uh, aspect continues to uh, handle uh, emergency plans and work closely with the York County EMA, as well as uh, state and federal emergency management agencies. Um, an example there, as Chaz was saying earlier, you know, that storm that came through last Monday uh, did a lot of, lot of damage. I know the avenues was hit pretty hard with some trees down and flooding. Uh, we did work closely with the county to try to get uh, damage estimates in. And again, the, if there is a possibility of us to recover any funding for that, uh, we'll stay on top of that and be able to uh, hopefully recoup any costs that would be eligible for us. Uh, the EMA or, or EMA aspect also offers uh, CERT classes throughout the year. Currently, there are we have nothing scheduled, but uh, please you know keep an eye out for that. The CERT is a community emergency response team, and it's a group of volunteers that would learn uh, basic you know uh, rescue techniques, some things that happen in a disaster that they would be able to come out and help. Um, to date, that's a great program. We have a lot of people through that. So as that uh, becomes available again, we'll get that out, the message out. Uh, one thing that will be coming up is uh, working with uh, the Health Bureau will be a, uh, September is uh, Emergency Preparedness Month. There will be a, and actually there'll be some information coming out here shortly. In September, there's gonna be a family emergency preparedness class. Uh, it'll be a chance for not only the adults, but for the kids as well. It'll be a series of four classes that's gonna cover things basic, uh, emergency preparedness, emergency first aid, um, pet, what, what do you do with pets in a, in a disaster? So it's gonna cover a lot of that. It'll be family oriented. And um, again, please look for that. It's gonna run, right, right now it, it is being fine tuned for the dates, but it should be four classes uh, during the month of September. Uh, through York County, we still have Smart 911 available. Uh, Smart 911, and there is some information in the back if anybody needs any, uh, how it works. Uh, Smart 911, you would go to their website, smart911.com. You're able to put in information basically before the emergency. You can put in, uh, and it's safe and secure, you can put in uh, information, medicine, uh, information on family, on kids, if a kid goes missing, and then all that information can be given to first responders uh, as they're responding to the emergency. Um, it, it's a great tool, it's safe, it's secure. They send you emails every, every few months that you can update your information. So uh, if you haven't signed up for that, please consider that. And again, information is in the back. Uh, we do continue with our smoke detector program. So anywhere in the city that needs, uh, if you require smoke detectors in your home, uh, our firefighters can come out and get those installed, the proper amount of smoke detectors in the proper locations. Uh, we've already installed, uh, since we've been running this program, over 6,000 detectors in the city. Um, just uh, back a few months ago, we teamed up with the American Red Cross. They are running a program nationwide to reduce fire fatalities by 25%. Uh, during that uh, outing, it was a one-day outing, we were able to get 675 detectors installed. 
And I'm happy to say that we're gonna team up with them again in October. Uh, that is being fine-tuned. We're probably gonna be in the south end of the city, but again, we're, we're working out details to get that. Uh, but regardless, anybody that needs smoke detectors, uh, please give us a call. We can make sure to get those up. And again, there is some information in the back on, uh, on how to obtain those. Um, and then one last thing is that the mayor was talking about some of the, uh, the technology available today. Uh, again, uh, you can always contact us through our office. Uh, we are active on uh, Facebook and Twitter as well as the, the city's webpage. Uh, we try to get the message out, um, any type of emergency to let people know what's going on. Uh, if we know there's some road closings or things that would be affected, uh, try to get that message out in a timely manner if we can. And again, I'll be here uh, afterwards if there is any questions. Yes, thank you, <laughs> thank you. Uh, next week, uh, next Tuesday, August 1st, we will be having our annual award ceremony. Uh, it is open to the public. It's gonna be 10 o'clock in city council chambers. And uh, during that ceremony, we're gonna recognize some firefighters for service performed, as well as some community members who offered a lot of support to us. So uh, if you can join us for that, we'd love to see you. Thank you. Good evening once again. Uh, I'm going to be brief because I'd much rather talk about the, the things that you want to talk about other than the, the myriad of things that I could stand up here and, and recite to you. But two commercials to begin with. The first one is one week from now on Tuesday is National Night Out all across the United States here in the city of York. Uh, I'm not sure the exact count this year, but we generally run between 25 and 30 different sites around the city that uh, we all try and get around to. So. Uh, you know, please find one near you and go out and enjoy a good evening with your neighbors. It's, it's meant to get people out of their homes and onto the street, which I think we need a lot more of. But, uh, you know, take that opportunity to get out and do that. The other thing, just yesterday I sat in a, uh, a round table with Senator Casey talking about the opioid issue. And uh, it just, I want to continue to remind people here in the city. At our police station, we have a, a drug take back box that uh, you can walk into our lobby, you can put stuff in there. So if you have medicine sitting around your home, one of the, one of the major problems that started our opioid issue is, is prescription drugs. So if you have things sitting around your home you're no longer using, if you went and had surgery and uh, you know, you're know you past your pain period, you're now able to get around without uh, using the narcotics that were given to you, don't allow them to sit around inside your home. Bring them down, put them in, the, uh, put them in our drop box, it's locked, you just dump them in there. You can take the labels off if, if you wish, that way no one knows your name. Uh, but uh, no questions asked, we want you to drop the medicine off and we will dispose of it with you. It's th through a uh, partnership with the Solid Waste Authority. They help us get rid of the, uh, get rid of the medicine. So please take advantage of that. Uh, I didn't introduce myself, I'm not in my uniform today, but I'm Wes Cayley, I'm the police chief for the city of York. Uh, the men and women of our department have been very busy. You see us on the news sometimes, unfortunately, it's generally with, uh, with the bad things. Uh, one of the biggest things we have going this year is our group violence intervention initiative. And uh, in a nutshell, what we're doing there, we had our first call in a few months ago, earlier in the year. And uh, we I have identified in assistance with John Jay College, the groups within the city of York and individuals that belong to those groups that are responsible for most of our violence. One of, the thing when we, one of the things we find when we look at violence in our city, in any, any city or any location, is that generally 1% or less of the population is responsible for uh, the violence that goes on. If you've heard me talk before, I always talk about the 1% and the 99%. What we do through uh, GVI, we call it the Group Violence Intervention, we want to address those, that 1% of those individuals. And we do that in several ways. Uh, one of the ways is reaching out to them. We call them into a call out certain people that aren't, they may be shooters, they may be people that happen to be around a lot of shootings, and we give them a message about what we and our partners are going to do. We also reach out to them and uh, we offer help to anyone that wants it. We have a great setup with, uh, with people around the community that uh, we've been able to utilize when people need things such as uh, childcare, uh, home assistance, uh, job training, job help, those sorts of things. And we ha have had individuals take advantage of that and we've been able to help them uh, along the way. 
We also have people from the community that come out and speak at these things and talk about uh, their experience, whether it be someone that was involved in gun violence and was arrested and did time in jail and how that affected their life, uh, a mother or a father who had a child that was killed uh, due to the gun violence here in York, to talk about how that is, has affected their life and their family, and also uh, someone that kind of gives a message of hope uh, for the city. The police department side of that is to cooperate with all our partners, but also to kind of be the stick to the carrot in a way. Uh, if people don't want to take our warnings, they don't want to ask for our assistance and they want to continue in the lifestyle of violence, then we're going to do what we need to do to deal with the, that 1% of the population. We've run some great uh, proactive details that have taken many of these members off the streets from these groups. Uh, DVI has had a great effect from the beginning. We had about a 35% reduction in our shootings up until earlier this month. We went through a two-week time period, and I'm sure you all saw on the paper, where our shootings jumped up because of group violence again between three different groups in the city of York. Since then, we've been targeting those groups, both in the way that I, I mentioned earlier, by going out and reaching out to the members of those groups, but also in proactively going out and arresting those individuals. And we have their names, we know who they are, so we go out one at a time and we target them and we take them off the street. We've taken several of them off the street already. Just today, two more were taken off the street along with their guns. So the men and women of our police department are out there working very hard. I know one of the things that uh, impacted the neighborhood, er the uh, avenues area of the city, recently there was a spat of robberies, armed robberies that went on. You guys do a great job of communicating. I, I see those emails, people send me those emails, and that's what you need to continue to do. We were able to put together a proactive group of officers that went out, we were able to identify the people that we thought were involved in those robberies and in a very short time we were able to take them off their street off the streets arrest three people and take all three of their guns off the street with them and i think if you look now hopefully you'll agree with me you've seen those robberies drop back off because we've taken those individuals off the street unfortunately many of them were juveniles uh, and we arrested them about a year ago uh, for the same thing. So they spent about a year in the, in the system and got back out and went right back to what they were doing. But our officers went out proactively and did a great job and, and took those individuals off the street. Our community services side of the house has been very busy as they always are in the summertime. They, they take kids bowling twice a week. They do a great thing where our officers get out twice a week with the, the kids from the community and they bowl and they spend time with them and they eat lunch with them to, again, to try and interact with them. They're busy with the Martin Library project that we, we do once a month where our officers get out there and play video games with the, the kids again to try and interact and uh, increase that relationship between the, uh, between the kids in our community and police officers. Soon the York Fair is going to start and our community services division will be down there again so stop out and see them at the booth that they're at every year. Uh, they have all kinds of events that are, that are always going on. National Night's a huge one that's, that's getting ready to happen. As a result of things that have been going on in the nation, and I'll finish up with this, York, I was proud of York because they were very much different than what we saw in other, other places when it came to the relationship between the police department and the community. And I'm not saying that, that, that we're where we need to be. The great thing that, that I loved about York was we were able out of that to put together a group that myself, along with police chiefs from other areas such as, as Springsbury Township and Northern Regional, we get together once a month with a group, uh, we call it the, the police and pastors group, the police and clergy group. It's, it's mainly pastors and clergy from across the city, across the county. And we get together and we talk about the issues that are going on in our community and the relationship between the police officers and uh, and the community that they serve. And it's been a great benefit for us. We, we most recently were able to call on those individuals when uh, one of our officers was accused of, of some abuse. And we were able to show some of those individuals a videotape of what actually occurred and get their feedback on it. So we can be very open with them. We've created a great relationship. And, and I think the best part of that group is not everybody in that group is someone that says, yeah, the police are great, rah, rah, rah. There's people in that group 
that uh, aren't necessarily, and I don't want to use the term friends because I think we've developed a, a respect and friendship, but there are people in that group that are, are uh, someone that would sit and not take our side right away. And that's what we want. We want to be able to sit around a table with those individuals to build a better relationship with our community here. So with that, I'll end so, and be happy to answer any questions that anyone has later on. Thank you to each and every one of the directors. Um, we, I sincerely appreciate you all being part of our cabinet. Um, we couldn't do all that we're doing uh, without you all, and I appreciate it very much. I appreciate the people that work within your departments. Uh, please make sure they know. We appreciate all the hard work that goes on. There are about 350 75, 350 people that work for the city of York. And um, it, it's very important that they know that we appreciate them as well. I know there are some employees or staff people, colleagues, associates here with us tonight. We have legal counsel over here making sure we're okay. And um, again, we just appreciate everyone. So thank you very much. Um, questions, comments, I need you to move up to the microphone so we can all hear you, um, but it is your time to talk to us, to let us know your concerns, to ask any questions that you might have of us as well. We have um, our first Facebook question that came in. It is for Shavosky. <laughs> Imagine that. Um, it's a good question. It's about retention. What are we doing, I guess, the city government, uh, to help new businesses stay alive and thrive? Uh, so come on up and talk about our partnership with every other agency, and et cetera. And please, if there are comments or questions, please come down front. Don't be shy. Uh, to the microphone. Yours. Thank you. I might need Mr. Lehman to help me answer this question since it involves a little alchemy. That's, that's a joke. Um, very matter of factly, in terms of business retention, um, we recognize very wholeheartedly that most of the businesses in the local economy are really where the backbone of our, our dollars and cents make sense, pardon the pun. Um, and we do everything we can to assist them in the form of either technical assistance, access to capital, connection through resources and networks. But really, we recognize that in economic development, it's not a single activity. It's really, if the metaphor applies, it's an Olympic sport. And that Olympic sport involves everything from track and field to the judo javelin guys. It's a whole comprehensive team all working to try to get someone to be successfully in business to stay in business. So while there's no secret sauce to anyone that actually is pursuing an entrepreneurial effort, um, please know that our office stands ready whether it's from a zoning question all the way through to actually working through some of the harder nitty gritty details of actually trying to get someone dialed in to get their business advanced. But um, there's really no definitive answer for it. We're available. We encourage anyone to contact our office directly and work with us on a case by case basis through any technical assistance. And we will definitely lay out um, the groundwork and, and the roadmap of where those resources may be for whatever their particular issue may be. So I don't know if that. Oh. Absolutely. Um, as the mayor just prodded me to share with you, um, to demystify the Olympic sport, to, to talk about some of our local partners, we do have your county economic alliance by virtue of their relationships with access to capital and their technical expertise with site selection and or identifying a space and or any other need that might be from an activism standpoint to lobby for reform or change at the state level. Um, we work doggedly with Downtown Inc., who I referenced before and gave a shout out to. Um, we have a great partnership with Community First Fund locally, um, as well as in Lancaster. Um, Service Corps retired executives, um, Kutztown SBDC, the Shippensburg SBDC. I mean, we have at least a, a solid network of individuals that are here to help us help you in whatever capacity we can to help you either, you know, keep your business in business or grow your business and expand it. Thank you, because I don't sing. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> Hi, my name is Melanie Scott Nicky, and I live at North Hawthorne Street. Um, I know you push or recommend uh, we use electronics. Um, 
to pay bills and so forth. Okay. I prefer to do mail. And my question is the SOAR bill. It's been three months since the SOAR bill is out of whack. It used to be due on the 15th. Now it's due on the 31st. I got it on the 24th. That gives you, what, six days to pay it. For somebody who is on a fixed income, maybe only gets their check on the third, it's really inconvenient. Is there something that you're going to do to rectify that whole situation? Thank you. Thank you very much for bringing this up. I was kind of hoping I can get through the night without talking about sewer bills, but <laughs> I wouldn't be doing my job. Make sure you really say it too. Oh, man. All right. So the great thing or the interesting thing about technology is that it's only great when it works. Um, the city embarked upon uh, implementing a new financial management system back in 2014. Um, the current or the system that is being replaced was over 20 years old. Um, maintenance agreements had been long outdated, legacy systems, et cetera. It, it really was time for a change. Unfortunately, as we're working through this change, we're, we're incurring setback after setback. Uh, this implementation has not been smooth by any means. So um, definitely know all about your struggles and, and what's going on with the sewer bill process. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, we haven't been able to turn the corner yet. What we're doing uh, as we go, go through it, and we were anticipating some trouble. So what we're doing is that even though the, uh, the due date is at the end of the month, if it's paid after that due date, there won't be a late fee assessed. <laughs> now, they want to, the reason why that's not being major uh, announced is that we don't want people to again, then begin to abuse the system. So uh, we are working hard. Uh, we think in August we will be able to get the mills out much earlier, uh, but we're still working through issues. Um, how the lockbox system works with the bank, how the online system integrates with our new financial management system. Uh, are we going to go with a new online system, the app, et cetera? There are so many components to this technical thing that it, I wish our list of 57 open items weren't there, but there are a significant number of technical issues that we are working through. Uh, we appreciate your patience, uh, your, your patience as you call in, and um, it takes a while for us to get back to you, et cetera. Uh, longer waits at the windows, what have you. Uh, we, we know all of, well, I shouldn't say we know all of the issues. We are fully aware uh, that we have to improve and get better, and we will do so. And we do appreciate um, U.S. mail and the telephone as well, too. So um, those things are still things we, we accept. Uh, you can call City Hall at any time and reach any one of us, as well as uh, leave messages, of course, and we respond to U.S. mail. So thank you as well. Yes, ma'am. I'm not sure actually who I should address this to, but all of you, I guess. Um, York City has become a big haven for the drug rehab uh, homes that are being purchased as drug rehab facilities. And um, a personal friend of ours, her daughter actually had lived in one and was given opioids there and mm -hmm. died. Now my question to you as city people, council or whatever, are these properties and the people that are purchasing them, do you know who's purchasing them? Do you know why? And are they being regulated and controlled that these people are not going in there specifically to get the drug and then die while they're there? Yeah. Uh, there's quite a few right here within the avenues area. Yes. Some are being maintained outside of the property, but some are not. And uh, it is a concern as to uh, how these are being watched and is there foresight and oversight as to how these things are being handled? It is an issue um, that crosses uh, many disciplines up here. Uh, when I was community development director for the city of York, we sat down and talked with HUD, the Housing Urban Development Organization. We saw this proliferation um, coming our way in the city of York, and unfortunately, um, laws wouldn't allow us to really address it the way we wanted to. Um, I'm going to let Shabaski and the chief, Chief Kelly, 
uh, speak to the regulation, those that aren't regulated, um, and ownership. Ownership for most any property is public information, and you can obtain that as we do the same way. But, Chief? From our end, it's a huge issue. I mentioned earlier that it was just at a round table yesterday with Senator Casey, and I use that opportunity to bring it up once more. Every time I get a chance to speak with someone about it, I bring it up because uh, to me, it's a horrible crime. We're, we're talking about helping people with addiction problems, with disease, and we're, people are sending relatives. To, the crying shame of it is people are sending relatives to those places, believing they're sending them to the right place to get help, to get clean so they can be better, and are being victimized while they're there. And I'm not saying that every single one of them is an issue, but we need legislation from our state to allow them to be better regulated. Right now, it's just not there from, from my end. Uh, Buffalo can talk about you know, his end, but uh, you know, it's, it's something I scream about whenever I get a chance because I think it's something that needs to be addressed along with, we, we used to, and it was taken away from us, there used to be a, uh, an enhancement when we charged a drug dealer if they sold near a school. Uh, the court, took that away from us, unfortunately. But uh, to me, we need the same sort of thing near a rehab center. Because, I mean, what better place if you're a businessman and you know the people that, that use your product live in a certain location and now we're housing several of them in one location, I'd go there too to, to make my sales. I mean, it's good business. It's not the right business, but it's, uh, it's a good business model. So uh, there's a lot of things that need addressed and we continue from our side to try and, and do that. Um, to answer your question, ma'am, and there's no real direct way to answer it, but I'll answer it in this fashion and hopefully it'll get to a route where you can follow the breadcrumbs to a degree. Um, the community, when it developed its zoning ordinance, decided where those allowable uses could be and could not be. And in most instances, as Mayor Lou alluded to, those individuals that are suffering from the affliction of of addiction, that disease, they're a protected class under federal law. So you can't necessarily say you're not allowed to have any place that has, you know, a property that caters to this demographic. They have federal rights. And that's the delicate balancing act where it's partly where we try to interface with the federal law and locally define where we want it to be. In those instances where there are legitimate, legitimate houses that have supervision as per the ordinance, that have gone through the process of being inspected, that have gone through the process of being licensed and operate as such, we don't typically see those issues. It's these fly by night, under the radar, let me get a single family house because it's a foreclosure, whatever it might be, exploiting the market, that decide to rent out a group home. And in that group home, a lot of these folks, as Chief alluded to, they're not necessarily getting the help that they need. They're being exploited for more revenue because they can rent rooms for whatever amount in the dollar. Um, some of these are legitimate operations that I've pointed out. Those that we can identify that actually run good shops, do well, and actually do the community a service. Our challenge is always trying to find the ones that aren't necessarily there. And then you get the issues where you get the police calls or you get the fire calls of things that happen and you're like, wow, I can't believe that took place in that neighborhood. But our folks have been very adept at going in once they're identified and taking every actionable step they can to shut those places down. The problem is, by virtue of our market being the way that it is, when you close one down, someone pops another one up someplace else. So it's a constant game of let me find it, let me do something to it, let me get it addressed and get it shut down and get it tamped down properly. Um, there's two approaches to that. You can assist us by letting us know where those are and we can then take our efforts to figure out are they legit, are they in compliance, are they properly licensed and are they inspected? Because again, our folks as vigilant as they may be, can't necessarily be everywhere at all times to see every issue. So again, it's that ebb and flow of you working in concert with the community to serve your needs. Um, secondarily, I would encourage you on a greater level, those folks that we have in elected positions, if they can continue to advance the conversation at the legislature by writing their folks that are in office to define laws that can hopefully better address this issue, we encourage you to do that too. But in terms of my role, I need you to be my eyes on the street so that my folks can go out and address the issue as best as we can. Because again, there's no short supply of folks that call in constantly and say, it's not my house, it's two doors down, but then they're 
they're suffering because they have to live in that current set of circumstances. They're under siege in some instances in some neighborhoods because of the issue that's taking place. So I encourage you and encourage your neighbors to continue to work with us to try to identify them. And we can make sure that they're legit. And if they're not, they will be shut down. Tying into what Sobosky Buffalo just said, I've been following some blighted properties in the avenues, and I report the properties. The inspector comes out. We have a conversation. We interact through telephone, through email, for me only to find out that these properties are rental properties and nobody knows about it. You have a lot of people that are trying to sell homes that can't, and then you see the, the sale sign go down, and the fur rent sign go up. Uh, over the magic of a weekend, you have new neighbors, and no one knows who they are, where they came from. The property starts going downhill. The inspectors come out and come back and say, the owner's in Florida. I had a case on Florida Avenue. The owner is in Florida. He's running it to a guy who's running a garage. I mean, this was a heck of a job to find all this stuff out. Yeah. And I followed it from start to finish. And the young lady that I was working with was Patricia Mayer. Hats off to her, good job. When I completed everything, I saw that there were a 55 gallon drum, two of them, of motor liquids sitting in the driveway. I took it upon myself to get license numbers for the car dealer who was operating this illegal garage in the 600 block of Florida Avenue. Sent an email in stating, here are, the, here are the license plate numbers. I'd be happy to testify. And the response that I got back was, these people are hard to catch. And that to me stopped me in my tracks <laughs> as far as what I was trying to do with these properties. But, this guy lives in Florida, renting a place out to a mechanic to a car dealership. And you know, you have to you have to be more forceful with these people that have these garages in their in their house, on the street, and then these rental properties that no one's supervising. This is the root, I think, of a lot of the neighbors in this area and the neighborhoods in the city that are causing them to have a lot of blight. Thank you. Do you want me to respond? Okay. Any other question? Did you want me to respond to that chat? No, I just wanted to make okay. a point about it. Because I agree with you. I mean, it's one of those issues that we are working with, and enforcement is a challenge. James Wise, I'd like to know, as far as what you being the mayor are planning on doing about the violent crime rate in this city. By what? The violence and the crime rate in the city. Mm -hmm. What are you planning to do about it? Because in the end, everybody sitting up at this panel works for you being the mayor. Mm -hmm. So what is your plan? What type of actions are you planning on doing? Thank you. Um, I don't know if everyone heard that. The question was, what is my plan to help address the violence that is going on in our city? These are directors that all report to me. My plan, they know my plan, and what we are implementing is our plan. Um, as the chief indicated, Chief Kelly, we have initiated this this year our gun violence intervention program and 
project, if you will, with John Jay College of New York. That's our number one project right now to do more to address the crime. I am a native of York, I'm a homeowner of York, I'm a mother, a nana, all those things in York as well too, and deeply, deeply concerned about the violence that we have in our city. Um, we have partnered with our faith-based community, we partner with other community services organizations, we partner with residents. I think your government is doing quite a bit to do all that we can. It's time for parents, dads, moms, home people in their homes to step up and work alongside us and um, help address these issues. Um, we are here to help. We are here to provide services. We have started a summer legacy work program. This is our third year of hiring our kids, putting our kids to work every summer so they're not idle and sitting by. We have more programs. I can't even rattle them all off, but they're on our website. Or we can provide even a handout of all the youth programs that are available. And again, our partnerships with many of the social agencies have been initiated by me, through my directors, through all of us, um, to ensure that we can provide the best and safe environment that we can. Um, I can't be in every home. Our police officers can't be in every home. But there's somebody in these homes with these children uh, that need to step up and be the adults that they need in their lives. And we're willing to work with them. It's just like the, the, police, the, the chief of police said, he arrested two people today. What good does it do when all they get is a $75,000 bail and they get caught with an illegal gun? Mm -hmm. Okay, so You're right. now they're out there doing that. So what, what needs to be done about stuff like that? Um, and again, I'm not sure that you have a suggestion for your city government outside of everything else that we have already are doing. Um, the layers of bureaucracy that's often involved in some of the things you're talking about, um, a, a judge did that. So do we need to go talk to them? I mean, there's a whole lot of other people involved in locking up and keeping children children away. And is that what is that the kind of society we really want? I mean, we're trying to provide, pardon me? Okay, that's fair too. I mean, I get that. Um, I'm talking about the children that we are seeing and the young people we're trying to reach early on. Even our partnership with our school district is doing some of those things. Um, the adults, what do you want me to say? I mean, Adults committing issues and crimes and negativity in our community, in my opinion, get what they deserve. And our community needs to stand up and make sure that continues to happen. And if that's stronger law enforcement laws on the books, um, it is what it is. But it's time out for decent neighbors and citizens to have to be subjected to the drama we are seeing in our city. And um, I don't. I'm open to suggestions. Uh, and then you keep saying about children, okay? Adults or whatever, people. Okay. I mean, a lot of the things you... we are seeing have started in the homes and are young people, people who aren't even old enough to own a weapon. They may not be children. Um, yeah. or even if they're the adults, many of them aren't even allowed to have a weapon because of a prior conviction. So, I mean, the cycle is indeed vicious. Um, but we have partnered with a number of agencies and organizations to try to provide opportunities, um, GED training, jobs, et cetera, to people so that they can lead productive lives. So, um, but if you don't, I'm open to any suggestions you might have. No, I'm just asking I'm, as far as all these programs mm -hmm. that are being talked about, okay, it still comes to a point where sometimes the programs don't work. Okay, so now when I say that the programs aren't working, and he said 1% of the people keep committing these crimes. Right. Okay, so when does it come a time when you say, okay, we can't rehabilitate these people and we have to do something about it? And what is and that something, And sir? what's getting done? What is that something? I don't know. That's why I'm asked here to ask oh, okay. you. Okay. All righty. Well, I believe we have implemented some good somethings, um, some ideas and some ways to try to address it. It's not, you know, we can't solve every societal ill. And we as a city government have recognized that, but we're smart enough to partner with some other people that can help us to address some of these ills. Um, but um, yeah, it's a sad day. Um, that when we had some of the dramas that we're having across the country, across cities in America, um, 
New York is doing what we can and, and working hard and tirelessly to address it. Thank you. I'm sorry, can I say something? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize that. No, much. that's all right. No, I just, I just wanted to address one thing, and I didn't talk about it when I gave uh, my talk earlier. Uh, one of the things that drives me crazy, and we have a tremendous amount of problems in this city that we, need, that we know we need to continue to work on, but uh, since 2010, when Mayor Bracey came in, I was tasked with dropping our Part 1 crimes below 2,000. For those that don't know, our Part 1 crimes are in the UCR are our most serious crimes. They're murder, they're rape, they're robbery, they're burglaries, they're aggravated assaults, uh, arson, and uh, stolen vehicles. To give you some context, in, in the 1990s, our Part 1 crimes in the city of York were well over 5,000. They were probably around 5,500. I don't know the exact number off the top of my head. Putting the stuff in place that we have under the direction of Mayor Bracey, this is the fourth year now, I think, that we've been below 2,000 Part 1 crimes. <laughs> That's tremendous if you think about it. I'm not saying that we're anywhere close to where we need to be, but I'm saying that our officers, the men and women uh, uh, that go out and protect this city are working diligently, they're working very hard, and as the gentleman said, unfortunately, people get arrested, they get released. We do our part. We're the gatekeepers of the criminal justice system. There are many other parts of the criminal justice system that uh, you know, make decisions along the way. And unfortunately, they're not always the best decisions, uh, just as all of us aren't infallible. So we're working hard. As the mayor said, we need the community's help. We're at that place. Our officers are out there working hard for you but we need assistance to make this a, a better place. But I wanted to address the fact of how much great work has been done since 2010 in this city. That's a tremendous number to drop from about 5,500 to under 2,000. I think our low two years ago was 1,800. Last year, we were in the 1,900s. Our plan is to make sure it stays there. Uh, as I remind Mr. Uh, Buffalo many times, I, I am economic development. Uh, we know we need the crime rate to be down in order for things to get better here in the city of York. Thank you. Hi, my name is Edith Freeland, and I live um, on West Maple Street, New York. And first of all, I just want to say thank you to Mayor Bracey and everyone her staff for making York a great place to live. And I, just, I understand there's a lot of crime out here, there's a lot of shootings and everything, but no one is placing a gun in anyone that's on this staff's hand. These people are making concerted efforts to break the law, and they need to be punished. These people can't, the police officers are doing all that they can do, but it starts in the home. So we need to come together. There was a, a meeting at Shiloh Baptist Church. There were members of the clergy, people in the community that were there. So come out and help us. Work together with us. We are here to make the city better. We have great leadership. So for those of you who feel maybe, what are we doing about the crime? Help us help you. It starts in the home. You know your child should be home. You know you need to be an adult. Take care of that. So I feel like the city is doing as much as they can, but they need a partnership with everyone else. It's not about pointing fingers. It's about solving a problem. And I think all of us want to live in the great city that York is. So I want to commend Kaylee and everyone else here for doing a tremendous job and to keep doing what they're doing. So I know I don't want to hear gunshots. Unfortunately, I live in a neighborhood that relatively is safe, but not everyone can say that. So we just need to come together, brainstorm, get these people off the street, because like I said, if you commit a crime, you do the time. It's that simple. You know, minors, they're only going to be minors for a while. They're going to grow into adults. And at that time, lock them up. Do what they need to do. Get these guns off the street. But the people who obey the laws aren't the ones who are breaking the laws. So let's just all come together to work, make things work. Because York is a great place to live, and I enjoy living here. Are there any other questions from in here? I think Aquina might have another one from Facebook Live. Okay. 
Any other questions or comments? Yes, ma'am. Good evening, everybody. My name is Andrea Carabello. I am born and bred from York City, and I'm proud of that. Um, I have three children. I am also a county um, of York employee. I am the office manager at District Court 19105. Um, what I come to bring tonight and just question for anyone here on our podium here, um, it pained me. Last week, I had a mother come into my court in tears because she didn't know which direction to go. She has a 15-year-old um, out-of-control son. She is working hard. She is a mother of six. She is working hard to take care of all her children. She has this one who is running in the streets, and he is claiming he's representing one side of town. Um, she tries to tell him, come home. She informed me that she reported him as a runaway. Um, three weeks ago, she has tried to contact Children Youth Services. Where's her direction to go? She does not want her son in a body bag, nor him to place someone else's child in a body bag. At that point, she can't afford to run around and look for him day and night. Um, she turned it over you know, to the police saying he's a runaway. Children and youth, what can I do, you know, as a mother of a child that is out of control? She is a parent that's trying to step up and step forward and to assist you guys with assisting her. But what does she do at this point? We can't, you know, physically leave my court or off the bench and go track down a child when the information was provided to our police department. And I, and I know that she's sincerely a mother that is trying. You have just for those couple of parents that we keep saying, come on out, you know your kid is doing this. You have a million parents that are standing strong and trying to help keep these kids from gang banging side by side. You know, this side of town, that one over here is doing this shooting. What resources do we have to get to a parent that is active and willing to help you? Um, you know, she's going to places, calling the police, pointing them out. I saw my son here, he ran. I saw my son there, he ran. What does she do at this point when he is actively reported as a runaway, actively running around her gang banging? What can she do? It, you know, it's a tough one, and we, we deal with the runaways in this form every single day. And just like you said, he ran from her, he runs from us. Uh, we're not going to use a tremendous amount of force against a young man that, that's a runaway, unfortunately. <laughs> Eventually, we'll, we'll catch up to, to him. If you, I don't know if you know her name or if you can get that, you can ask her, I'll give you my number before I leave. You can ask her to text me or call my cell phone number and I'll put her in touch with our gentleman that runs a group violence intervention program and uh, he'll do whatever he can to, uh, to help her out. You know, it's, it's a tough situation, but we're there. We're going to try and, and help, whether it be mediation in the family once a young man's back, whether it's some other services, whether it's us trying to help talk with some of the county services that are out there to help this along. That's why the group violence intervention program's there. We want to deal with the stuff up front. So make sure before we leave today that uh, you get my phone number, and somehow if she contacts us, we'll, we'll help her out the best we can. Thank you. All right. I can let these parents know that come sure. our way. Thank you. Before you leave from there, just turn around. There are some council members, some uh, pastors. I know for a fact that know some of these resources. Would you please raise your hand so she can see you afterwards um, over here that way? And Aquina Washington has a resource guy as well, too, that may be able to help after the chief. Thank you so much. Okay. We have another Facebook Live question, but... Okay, Shavosky, come on. <laughs> You're the man of the hour today, of the two hours. How can the planning and zoning office be more efficient other than directing people to a document on their website? No, that's a legit question. Yeah. I'll take it. Um, very, very, very legit question. I'll give it credence. And this is one of my own pet peeves because usually the phone calls trickle up. They don't trickle down. So when that individual doesn't get the service that they anticipate that they should have gotten from one of the staff, it typically comes my way. Um, there is ownership on two sides of this equation, um, typically from planning and zoning specifically. I know our zoning officer, of which we have one, who does both administration and enforcement. Um, Cheryl Roscoe is a consummate professional. But again, the demands of time and space means that there's only a finite number of work days in a week. And subsequently, not every call necessarily gets the five-minute turnaround treatment that some people feel that their projects deserve. 
That being said, also with our planning staff, we went from a robust team of probably 20 professionals in the 80s down to one city planner for all 5.2 square miles of the city of York. But again, our expectation and the charge of this administration is from a customer service standpoint that we will do our best to give everyone the credence in their project the attention that it deserves. So with that little PSA and ground rule laid out, um, I encourage each of my team members to be, even in spite of some of the deficiencies of some of the submittals, and let's just presume that someone submits something that isn't a complete document, that they work with that group as best as they can or work with that project as best as they can to advance it. Because our, our goal at the end of the day is to try to encourage as much investment in our community and be as business friendly as we can be. So um, if there's ever a situation like this, um, and I, I've got business cards here, whomever may be watching at home, if there is an opportunity where you feel as though your project isn't getting the treatment that it deserves, both myself and my deputy, Nicole Davis, typically interface at this issue. We do the blocking, tackling, interface at the problem and try to resolve whatever issue may be that may be with a specific project at any specific time. But again, please know that there is a finite amount of time in the day. There is a finite amount of people that are committed in terms of a staffing standpoint to address this issue. But we do want you to make the investment in our community. We do want you to contribute and continue to support the efforts that we're all collectively pushing to make York a better place to live. Thank you. You're welcome, Mayor. Yes, Mayor. I just want to say I lived in Dallas Town for 23 years, and I've never felt safer than I do on the avenues, even though it's in a townhome and I lived there for 23 years. I think what you all are doing are great. My husband works for the correction agency, for the prison, what you're doing is great. Just send out flyers by mail. And second, is there any way we can try to do something about the people speeding on the avenues? They know where the speed bumps are, like with Hawthorne in Pennsylvania. You know, there are so many every night I wanna sit and enjoy but it's almost like you want to stand out and start directing traffic because you know they're going to come down and they can't see. And I, I know the speed bumps are there, but sometimes they're going so fast that it's, it's, very, it's very scary. But thank you for everything you do. And I know it's just a traffic thing, but have a great day. And thank I'm you I'm going to let the chief of police answer <laughs> that. But he knows how I hate speeding in the city of York. In the city of York, the speed limit is 25 miles per hour, period. Um, and on Pennsylvania Avenue, you might be able to go a little faster, but it needs to be lower than 25. We live in a very dense city, lots of pedestrians, lots of people. Please be courteous and slow down. It's now summer and we've watched them, like I will go the speed limit, I'm a grandmother, and I've watched them pass me doing the speed limit, hitting the speed bumps and almost missing, and it's, it's, it's crazy, but you know, I didn't take it away. So I'm just saying it's getting, and semis now are coming through Pennsylvania. Okay. What, what block of Pennsylvania is? I'm sorry? 800. 800. Okay. And the mayor laughs about this because I think every, there's not a day that doesn't go by that she's on me about speeding in the city. Uh, we do two things. Uh, we have a speed board now that we put out places. And we also, what I'll do in, in the 800 block of Pennsylvania Avenue is we have a recording device that we put out that you can't tell is there. And we, we, we record for a week what's going on in that neighborhood uh, traffic wise so that we can tell the, the time of day, the hour, the day of week, that sort of thing, when the largest problem is. Because just like everyone up here has, has discussed, we only have a, a finite amount of people to do this job. And, and like every division in the city, uh, we're, we don't have enough employees. So what we try and do is target that to a specific time, a specific location so that we can address those issues. But now that you told me about that, I will, I'll make sure that uh, the next place we put the, uh, the speed box up is out there. And depending on what it shows, we'll, we'll do something from there. All right. We have time, one more question, and we'll be around to answer individually if needed. Um, we want to be mindful of everyone's time. We do thank you very, very much for coming out this evening. Again, thank you to my directors. Um, you guys are tremendous. I appreciate you. Dolores, your question, ma'am. Isn't that a question? Uh, my name is Dolores Minaya. I'm from the Avenues. 
I would like to say thank you to the police department. Um, my father, he's 85 years old, and he got lost the other night. It was raining, and one officer found him, and my dad, he doesn't speak English, but he was able to say my name, Dolores Minaya, and the police knew who I was and bring him home. That was, my family is happy with the service. I also want to say thank you to entire city. I noticed that many parks are being updated, renewed, and the kids are happy about it. And um, I just want to say thank you. Also, the school district, um, the program, the after-school program, that is something that is really a good thing for many families. And um, I give a high five to the school district because it's helping a lot of family. Yeah. As mother that before they didn't know what to do after school. Now they can come home, cook, and then go and pick up the kids because of the program. I just wanted to say thank you. Again, thank you all for coming out. Thank you, Dr. Holmes. We appreciate it, sir. Good luck with the STEAM Academy. We look forward to seeing you at your open house. And again, thank you. There's some school directors here. We thank you and other elected officials for being here. And all of you, the residents of the avenues and our city, thank you for being here.